All right, guys, it's Travelbox Reviews coming at you guys with my review for the 100 Season 6, Episode 4. All right, so another crazy episode this week for the 100. Uh, just a really crazy season so far, right? Picking up on all the new things that they're building here. I mean, really, they're, they're establishing this whole new world, right? Uh, and that also comes with this kind of mythology, this lore. Um, and, of course, some, some elements of it are actually things that we've already seen but now they're putting a little bit of a different spin on things, um, mainly as I refer to the chips, right, that they're putting in these people. Um, so this episode, I think, confirmed what a lot of us kind of thought going into it um, and had maybe theorized about the primes and how this whole thing works. A lot of people were, uh, you know, discussing, uh, even you guys were letting me know on some of the other reviews, um, you know, that when you die, that, that maybe is not actually the end of your life in, in, in a sense, right? And we got that little uh, scene there in episode two, I believe, uh, where they kind of talked about that and, and kind of alluded to that. So anyways, really crazy episode, of, especially the ending of the episode, just insane. I, I, like, I, I had to watch it over again because I could not believe what I, what I watched. But anyways, love to hear your guys' thoughts of this episode. What did you think of it? What do you think of that ending? I'd love to know your guys' thoughts and theories for going forward as well in the season. Uh, if you enjoyed the review, please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. would really appreciate it and uh, can't thank you guys enough for the recent support. So, anyways, let's get into a little bit of a recap here. We'll try to go a little bit quicker, then get to my rating, favorite character, and some more overall thoughts slash theories on what all of this means in this episode because we have quite a bit to unpack here. All right, so without any further ado, let's get into the recap of the episode. So we start off here uh, with Clark and the others attending the opening ceremonies for Naming Day. And so this is a huge uh, event, right? So Naming Day is an event in Sanctum where Delilah, in this case, but it, it could be really any of the, you know, aging children, right, or, or coming of age children, uh, and so, but this year's naming day, or, or this event, this year at least, uh, is Delilah's day, so it's basically where she gets a fresh start, becoming an adult, and gets a new name, and the new name is Priya, or, or Priya, uh, right, uh, so, uh, so at this point, that's kind of what we think it is, right, or, or, or at least, I mean, maybe you've had some you know, theories out there that you thought it was, you know, something a little bit more, but just on the surface, that's what it seems like. It just seems like every other kind of, um, you know, coming of age kind of day or celebration, uh, where you see a lot of this, right? A, a, a quinceanera, um, um, you know, more of these kind of events, right? Where you reach a certain age, uh, and you have these kind of celebrations and parties and, and, and all that stuff, right? So that's what we think it is, right? So that's what we think it is. And of course, it goes in a whole, whole different direction. Uh, so I did like this, though. They mentioned Murphy and Amori are back the ship guarding it. We did not see Murphy at all in this episode, uh, which I was a bit disappointed with because I like what they're doing with him right now. And I want to see where they're going to take that character. Um... But we don't see him in this one, and then we also don't see a couple of the other, uh, you know, main characters because they're back at the ship. So I did like at least they explained that to us here and referenced that so it wasn't just an episode where we were left asking, where are, where are these people? Like, who's, where's he? Where's her? Right? And all this stuff. So anyways, uh, good enough for me. I, I'm okay with it. So then we see the Sanctum people very happy for Delilah here. They seem to relish this event, really looking forward to it. A lot of them very excited. And it's also a time to make amends, as we see Russell uh, do with um, the hostage uh, woman, the woman who was taken hostage. I still don't remember her name, so I'm just going to keep referring to her as that, the, the red-haired girl. Uh, and so he apologizes for the death of her family members during the Red Sun. We see that whole process there, uh, and uh, and then we see the Sanctum people apologizing to themselves, trying to make amends. So it, it's it's more than just, you know, Delilah getting this new name and, and getting the chip, of course, but we find that out later. It's actually kind of a, a community event, right? And they, they kind of all get together over this event. Event. Um, and then I, you know, when we discuss a little bit later, maybe how these people have kind of came to believe in this, the prime's way of life and all this stuff that I think relates to that discussion because, uh, it's, it's not just right. Delilah getting renamed and getting this chip. 
it's also everything else, making amends, uh, forgiving their sins. It's it's more of kind of, uh, uh, you know, an all-encompassing holiday or event rather than just her getting renamed. Um, and so I do think that speaks back to that. So then we see uh, Clark gets inspired here and tries making amends with Raven. Doesn't work so well. Um, and so we had some really great back and forth here with Raven and Clark. Um of course, we know Raven and Clark are not on good terms after last season, and what happened to Raven as a result of Clark sending her to Dio, or sorry, I guess McCreary uh, and his uh, prisoners uh, there, so in the gorge. So, anyways, I like that scene though. Again, not sweeping things under the rug, really uh, bringing it to the surface, and I like some of the things Raven said. I think she had some uh, she had some good points, and also that kind of foreshadows actually a little bit when you look back at this. It actually kind of foreshadows the ending of the episode too, uh, where it says that she is looking for this fresh start, but she she never actually changes her choices and, and her behavior. And so now that's exactly what happens in the end. So anyways, I like that. So then we get a little bit of a different uh, perspective here where we see the children of Gabriel and uh, we see them beating on Octavia to get answers from her about Clark being a host with her night blood. So this this was kind of the first reference or maybe first confirmation for those of you who saw this coming uh, in that the host for the chips of the primes. And so essentially what the kind of mythology here is is if you're a night blood like Clark and like the Gabriel people have now seen, uh, you know, for themselves, um, if you're night blood, you can be a host. You're kind of an eligible host for these primes and for the prime chips. Uh, and so at this point, they think that Clark is now a, a new host and that they have to capture her before they put, you know, this prime chip in her. Um, now, whether, I mean, by the end of the episode, we could say maybe they're trying to save her here and maybe that is a good point. And so Octavia, of course, obviously doesn't know anything about what's happening, and so she's not going to give up Clark, right? And let's be real, I mean, Octavia is not going to help out anybody if it doesn't serve her right now, uh, you know? So that's just what it is. So really great stuff here. So Octavia, of course, not giving them anything, and the man who then subdued her last episode actually defends her and keeps her alive for now when one of the uh, women... Uh, or the one woman wanted to kill her, uh, or at least, uh, you know, start, you know, stabbing her, I guess, to get answers anyways. So this, uh, the guy Xavier, uh, is his name, kind of defends her there. So then we see later, Xavier leaves a knife next to her in his bag as he drops it on the ground next to uh, Octavia and the girl Rose. Uh, and so then we see Octavia cutting through the rope and the little girl and her escape together. I actually really like this, and I really wish they would have went with this a little bit further than they did, although Though we did have a nice scene there where Octavia, as they're running away, you know, says, I'm not afraid to her. Of course, that speaks back to um, some of the stuff where we saw her hiding in the floor, right, on the Ark. Um, and, and her basically being in Rose's position. So I love that scene. I just would have, I, I, maybe just one more scene or one more sequence with Octavia and the little girl. Uh, Rose coming together here would have been really great. And it's such a good dynamic because it's like, well, she just got kicked out for being the most, you know, harmful p person or most evil person of the group now. And now she's with a little girl. Like, how is she going to react in this situation? And I just thought it was really smart to do that. So, again, maybe a little bit more there, but I did like what we got uh, regardless. Um, so, so then we'll come back to Octavia and Rose uh, on the run. But first, I just want to quickly talk about Bellamy. Uh, so he had some really great character development in this uh, episode, along with Echo as well. But so we see Bellamy Clark and Bellamy and Echo scenes uh, here play out throughout the episode. Uh, so Bellamy is accepting Clark's apology, or uh, so it seems, right? He says he knows what it's like to leave someone he loves behind. And that's exactly what Clark had done to him last season, leaving him in the fighting pits there um well she was more focused on saving maddie at that point uh and of course he is speaking about his own sister octavia leaving her behind so i really did like that scene and that exchange i know a lot of fans are probably you know they want to see bellamy and clark together fair enough right fair enough um you know i don't really have an opinion either way on that um you know i'm more interested in all this mythology and all this the chip and tech stuff they're throwing at us here and trying to get uh, my my you know brain around that stuff 
wrap my mind around that stuff. But anyways, uh, so yeah, that was a great scene. They hug, and, and it was it was just kind of a nice, warm scene to contrast all the other stuff in this episode. So then we see how he treats Echo then at the party a little bit later as a result of him dealing with losing Octavia. Uh, to me, I, I saw this as he kind of feeling guilty for his actions as well, and he knows what danger he put her in here, and I think he does have some regret there as well for doing that. And of course he does. He even says to Echo, you know, it's being human. Um, and I and I completely agree with that. And then, of course, obviously he kind of mistreats Echo in this scene as well, making her feel bad, says she doesn't feel anything. Well, obviously that's not the case. Uh, and then we see that scene at the very end of the episode where Echo kind of explains to Bellamy what her past was. You know, I like that scene, but it's like, it's a, it's a season too late. I'm sorry, but I don't know. I mean... I like the scene, and I like the way it played out. I also think, uh, I think it's Tazia Tellez, is how you pronounce her name, the, the actress. She's a great uh, actress, um, and especially for that role, and of course, Bob Morley, great. So they did a great job in that scene. It was really well written, really great, but it's about a season too late. I just, they haven't got enough development for Echo in the past season or so, and it's really hurt her character as a result. So I like it. But maybe just a little too late for me. Anyways, just wanted to touch on that Bellamy stuff, and he was great in this episode. Uh, and I will talk about him a little bit later as well. So, anyways, now we get back to Octavia and Rose are on the run. So we see the Gabriel people catch up to them, and this is the scene where I was talking about where Octavia says, I'm not, af you know, telling the girl, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, and that stuff. So really great. Um, so the Gabriel people basically surround them, and just before they attack... Dioza and her Sanctum partners uh, show up to save the day. Uh, so then, uh, of course, they made a deal at the very beginning of the episode before the intro even played. Uh, the girl comes and basically makes a deal with Dioza that she can have her baby within the boundary of Sanctum, right? have, um, you know, obviously a safe delivery and all that stuff. In the, and then they will keep the baby inside there, but she is still not allowed in Sanctum at this point. Uh, but at least that's better than nothing for her, right? To have her child at least... Um, be safe and, um, and, 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 and be able to be born. I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, who knows if she's just out on her own in the wilderness, who knows? It may have some complications with the pregnancy and the delivery and all that stuff. Um, and so really great deal for her. So she takes this deal and they go after the Gabriel people to save Rose ideally, but maybe Octavia crosses her mind as well in there. So anyways, we see them kill all of the Gabriel people except for, of course, the one woman who Octavia goes after then and snaps her neck. Really badass scene there, but kind of satisfying because she was the one who wanted to stab Octavia earlier. So really great way that they uh, they played with that one. But, however, in the process of this all going down, the woman's bullet that she fires uh, back at them when, when she kind of gets up and starts running away catches Rose and actually hits her in the midsection and kills her. So a really emotional kind of sequence here where Rose is shot dead. And, uh, and of course, I'm not sure if she actually did aim at Rose here or it was just kind of, uh, you know, it just happened to catch her in, in, as it was, as she fired it. I'm not exactly sure. I think it was maybe the latter of that. Uh, but either way, it catches Rose and kills her here. And we see Dioza is partly to blame for this as she waited to pick Rose up, right, to, to save her. She said, no, wait, they might still, you know, one might still be alive or something like that. But if they had grabbed her at that point, maybe she would have survived. So it is, you know, really interesting, and I'm sure Dioza will kind of, you know, maybe feel guilty uh, for that, uh, for sure. But, you know, ultimately it's not her fault, right? Who, You know, she didn't know that, uh, you know, a bullet would, uh, you know, catch Rose on, uh, you know, in, in the process. So anyways, so we see the Sanctum girl uh, tell uh, Dioza the deal is off now that Rose died, of course, right? But if she kills the old man who they, who they refer to, uh, who is the leader of the Gabriel people, who is most likely Gabriel himself, right? Dr. Gabriel. And so... Basically, the deal will be honored again if she is able to track down this Gabriel guy and kill him. Uh, and of course, she wants this deal to be honored, so she says, consider it done. And then we see Octavia then, after she snaps the woman's neck, is off to kill the last remaining one, Xavier, right, who was left behind. Um, and by the way, I saw this on uh, on Twitter, so I gotta give uh, you know credit where credit's due, I guess. But Xavier Lincoln 2.0... I think it's such a great point because this is exactly how they set up Lincoln as being kind of the good one 
out of this kind of mysterious villainous group who she actually befriended and got close with and then they actually kind of you know fell in love and Lincoln's death in this show is is one of the most emotional scene sequences ever uh but that was insane anyways hopefully that doesn't happen to Xavier again but I really do feel the the, the comparisons are just just crazy there so anyways might be a Lincoln 2.0 anyways so then Dios and Octavia pair up and I love this line Dios says the devils from earth become the heroes of sanctum I love this line here and this duo they really are a great duo of outlaws so that just about does it then for Octavia and Dios's story in this episode so now we see the ceremony of the naming for Delilah as she walks into the palace or sorry before she walks into the palace she runs to Jordan and tells him not to let her become a face behind the glass, which is the title of this episode. And it also references their conversation earlier in the episode about him being in the cryo chamber uh, when Monty and Harper, you know, put him in there, right? And he was the face behind the glass of that chamber, um, which is really interesting there. Um and, uh, and, and and making a really good point, actually, and also giving Jordan a little bit of character development here. And we saw uh, him uh, finally got uh, uh, had had sex with Delilah there. So we know that uh, that did happen after all, even the last episode, it looked like uh, they got interrupted there. So that was great, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but anyways. So in this case, she is afraid that she might be a part, uh, or sorry, that she might be sort of lost in a sense after the process is complete. And so she doesn't want to be a face behind the glass, kind of trapped in this new body, and she's kind of just gone, and no one can interact with her. And so really, really great metaphor, and it really speaks back to the title so well of the episode and that conversation. So the writing here, really great. I love that. So then alongside this process, so then she walks into the palace, and everything's fine. Jordan here, a little bit skeptical at this point, as I think we all were, um, so, uh, alongside this, then we see Clark sleep with the, I believe he was the doctor, right? He is the doctor uh, for Sanctum. So, anyway, she sleeps with this doctor uh, who uh, they basically meet at the party or the dance, I guess, and, and they go back, uh, which is interesting. I mean, you know, I, I don't know the last time Clark's been with somebody. I don't know. I Not really at all in season five, to my memory. So, anyway, it was interesting. So, basically, uh, she falls for the wrong guy, right? So, he tells her that there are two sides to every story and that not every person on Sanctum believes in the divinity of the Primes. That word divinity is very interesting because it also gives us some confirmation that people actually do think of the Primes as divine, right? These divine creatures, um, you know, creatures, I guess, but, you know, divine, um, you know, beings, if you will, I guess is the better term, uh, instead of just normal people, right? And just not just leaders, but divine figures and, and, and people. So really interesting there. I think that word's important. And Clark even uh, emphasizes that divine, like divinity. So really interesting. So then, it is revealed that he is one of the Gabriel spies. Uh, so this was interesting. I didn't see it coming. Uh, they kind of foreshadowed it though. So fair enough. Anyway, so he's one of the Gabriel spies. And we see he hits Clark with a dart after she tries to escape out the window and run from this guy. So he hits Clark with that dart, the paralytic dart, right? And says he will get her to the children of Gabriel. He says to her, I'm not the one you should be afraid of. So really great stuff. I have to say... I was right. I got to take my a few seconds of fame here. The Gabriel people are really looking like the good guys at this point, especially after this ending. Um, I, I said in last uh, last review, I said, I think this is going to be a role reversal similar to the Mountain Men. And that's looking like exactly what is, is happening. So anyways, really great stuff here. So then we get Delilah walks out of the doors of the palace and Russell introduces her as Priya or Priya seventh of her line and then of course everyone says hallow be her name again relating back to that divine the divinity of the primes right there because that's exactly every time they mention a priya or one of these prime names everyone is just hallow by be her name right everyone is on board with this or at least the people living within the boundary right of sanctum so they basically purify their sins then by launching the lanterns up to the sky, uh, which again speaks to speaks back to the overall uh, kind of myth, mythos of the event rather than just the naming uh, itself. So 
then, though, <laughs> this is a big thing. So then we quickly learn, I mean quickly, learn that Delilah is not herself anymore as Jordan tries approaching her and she is someone totally different. Uh, <laughs> she does not recognize Jordan at all. And the guard even stops him from getting close to her as well. And speaking back to now that she is a prime, they're going to protect her with their lives, right? Um, and before, she, was, she wasn't she was a prime. She was just a, you know, a girl, of course, with night blood, but still, right? So, of course, we get this idea that because of the, the, the new chip, right, that's in her, her mind is totally gone. She is a totally different person. She addresses the mechanic boy that we meet, uh, that meets Raven earlier in the episode, as her beautiful boy. And just before, they were sister and brother, were they not? Right? Or, or something like that, related of some sort. Um, so, you know, our, our family members, but he was not her daughter, right? Or, sorry, he was not her son. So, right right away, we get this idea that, no, like, something is up here, right? Like, this is, she is a totally different person right now. And again, relating back to that face behind the glass, that's exactly what she has become. And Delilah was a little bit afraid of that at the time. Anyway, so then, uh, before the doctor can make it out with Clark, uh, he's gonna carry her there and, and try to get her to the children of Gabriel to save her. Uh, before he gets out, the guards find him and threaten to take him to Russell. But before they can... He slits his own throat, saying he won't give them anything, and his last words are death to primes. So, really interesting stuff there. You know, even uh, commits suicide, kills himself, so that Russell and them will not be able to get anything from him, um, and possibly torture him or something like that, um, you know, as he's become this, uh, or not become, but he is this spy for the Gabriel people. So, really crazy stuff, and now we get the idea like, oh, Clark's safe now! awesome, right? They saved her. Or is she safe? Uh, no. <laughs> so anyways, love this. And again, right, this whole sequence confirms exactly what I thought is the Gabriel people maybe are the good guys. Maybe they have a different way of doing things that may not connect exactly with the morals of Clark's uh, kind of space crew, if you will, group. But they might be the better guys here. They might be the good guys. But anyways, so I'm going to talk about this next sequence then very quickly, and then I'll share my thoughts. So to end, we see Clark carried in a room filled with skeletons of bodies where Russell and his wife wait. Really creepy room, really kind of dark, uh, eerie, just a really good setup for what happens here. So they basically, the guards come in, they lay her on the table as she is still under the paralytic. So again, this paralytic, right, she can see... She can hear everything, but she can't move. Uh, and, and, you know, but her, her brain's working, her eyes are working, all that stuff. She can't move. Uh, so, again, that just adds, like, the horror in this scene. It really is horror, I would say. Just t terror. Just really, just, like, eerie, unnerving, right? You can use all these words. It's just a crazy scene. So... Now, we see Russell's wife asks him why he hasn't given her the anecdote yet. Good question, right? Why hasn't he saved her? It's because she gives them an opportunity to bring back their daughter, Josephine, or at least her consciousness. Really crazy stuff here. So, because if they don't use Clark to bring Josephine back, otherwise they would have to wait 56 years to see her again because of Rose's death. Right? There would be no appropriate hosts until then who have the night blood and are part of, I guess, the same family tree, if you will. Um, so there wouldn't be a, 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 you know, a suitable host for Josephine if they don't use Clark. So we see Russell feels bad here, wiping away Clark, but can't resist the opportunity of getting Josephine back right this moment or right that night in the episode. Really crazy stuff. Really crazy. And again... The terror here, because we see Clark, she knows everything that's going on, she can hear everything, she's processing it, but she can't move, she can't do anything to stop it, so really great here. Anyway, so we see Clark then begin to cry, uh, again, because she knows what's going on, she knows what's happening, but can't do anything about it. We see you kind of rustle, uh, you know, wipe her tears, and she don't cry. Really crazy. So Russell then takes the chip. So very similar to the Commander chip, by the way. The same logo on there as well. So was this made then by Ali? Uh, the same kind of tech, right? But obviously we know the Commander chip is a little bit more advanced. 
Uh, and the commander chip has been in Clark before. So anyways, that connects to the whole discussion about whether Clark's going to be okay or not. Anyways, so he gets this chip from his wife's necklace, which is, I like this touch because it's in kind of this heart uh, shaped necklace, right? Most people are like, oh, you got a picture of someone who died or, or, or one of your kids in those little heart lockets usually, but these people have a chip of their daughter in their heart locket, so we see that. So anyways, he grabs this chip, he says, I'm sorry, Clark, I promise you won't feel pain. The mind of the host is erased, but the brain is left unharmed, confirming essentially what a lot of us kind of thought going into this, and maybe what well, some of us didn't, but confirming that basically the host, in this case Clark, but also Delilah earlier, completely erased. The mind of those completely erased, and now this prime chip will take over. Uh, and really crazy stuff. His wife then re reassures him that it was meant to be this way, that Clark arrived on the planet at the time she did for them to bring back Josephine. Uh, and, and she says something like, give us this vessel, right? So really crazy stuff. And then we see Russell say, no more fighting, Clark. You'll be at peace. And he sedates her as it fades to black. Really crazy scene. And if you would have ended the episode just off on that, okay. But then we get this next scene, and this was just insane. So then we see Clark wake up uh, in the bed beside Russell and his wife after giving the antidote to the paralytic. So she wakes up, screams right away, and she calls them mom and dad. And then they call her their daughter, Josephine. So crazy stuff here. Just insane. Uh, right when she came, woke up and started screaming, I thought, oh, it didn't work. Okay. Like, Clark is still here. It didn't work. No. It, it worked. It worked. And a lot of people are saying I've seen that, that, you know, she's faking it and whatever. I don't think so. I don't think it's possible because how would she know the hair twirling? How would she know some of these uh, mannerisms that she does in this scene? I mean, Alyssa Taylor did a great job in this performance, but no, nah, man, it, it, it's Josephine. It's it, Clark is gone now, uh, and I don't think she's pretending. Anyways, so just to connect things, right, she is now the girl from the flashback that we saw, and then uh, Russell and his wife are supposedly the dad and mom from that same flashback with the Red Sun Rising flashback that we got. And then we get the idea that that was the original family who has been preserved forever because of these chips and those are the primes. So everything kind of comes full circle here within this scene. And once you connect to it, I may uh, show a diagram here that I found. Um, uh, basically showing that same thought. But essentially that's what it is. Russell and his wife are the dad and mom from that. Josephine now is in Clark, who is the daughter in that scene. But my, my main question though, just quick, is didn't the dad kill them in that Red Sun event? So does that mean the chips were created after he killed them? during like i'm not sure exactly how that process went if they showed that the dad killed them both well then how did they make the chips of their minds was it at that moment in time maybe ali was there or something i'm not exactly sure but that would be my only question maybe someone could explain that for me but anyways um so we see the insertion of the chip in clark's neck and then she walks toward the mirror to see herself and says now this i can work with referring to Clark's body. So we know Josephine has now taken over the mind of Clark or the body of Clark. So, I mean, I'm sorry, but what the fuck? Like, that was just an insane ending, guys. I watched it last night, so I've had a little bit more time to process this, but what? Like, wow. So Clark is now gone. She's gone. Josephine has now taken over. What a twist to end off this episode. I was, honestly, I was just mind blown. I, I was, it, this was crazy. Really, really great ending to the episode. All right, so in terms of a rating for this episode, I'm going to give it a 4.5 out of 5. Uh, the one main critique of this one is that it was really unevenly paced. The, the, the start of the episode, and you notice maybe in the recap, they didn't actually talk a lot about the start of this episode. I mean, the first 20 minutes or so, not much happened. I mean, really, not much happened. And then the last, like, the last 10 minutes of this episode are insane. Like, with this whole Clark, uh, you know, sequence that plays out the Delilah thing, even Octavia and Dioza, I think, within that last 15 minutes, that whole thing happened. So, a really fast finish and a very slow start. So, to me, that it is a problem. It's not something that obviously, you know, 
really brings down the episode or anything, but it is just something I wish they would maybe improve on going forward, and I get the whole nature of it that they always kind of want to end on a cliffhanger or something that'll make you tune in next week, so I do understand that. I just wish the start of this this episode and last episode too were just a little bit too slow for me, um, and I would have liked to see a little bit more of even pace throughout. Great character development here for Raven and Bellamy. I already talked about Bellamy before. Uh, but Raven, really great, meeting this new mechanic boy uh, who is a prime, but seems to be the only prime, or at least the one of the you know family tree that actually doesn't seem to 100% agree with the whole prime mythology and everything. So that's going to be an interesting thing they're going to play on. Raven, of course, we know she hates going with the kind of status quo. Um, she's kind of rebellion in her own way. And it sounds like they were setting up this guy as the same. So it's going to be interesting seeing them kind of together. And we'll have to see what kind of relationship they develop. Really great stuff. Uh, so I'm loving the mythology and lore of this new world. Really great. The way they've set this all up, Jason Rothenberg. And, you know, obviously he's the creator. And obviously the team of writers, you know, he's not the only one. But I got to give credit to him and all the writers then. Or whoever came up with this concept for this season. They're doing a great job. In this episode, they did reveal a lot, but I feel like there's still a lot more to go that we do not know about. And so I really like what they're doing. And really, like, they foreshadow a bit, but they don't make it obvious. I mean, you kind of really have to think about this one. And that's something I've always loved about the 100. Yes, it gets cheesy at times, a little cliche, but this, the sci-fi element of the 100, I mean, this is, I mean, yeah, you could argue that there's other sci-fi shows on that are, that maybe have a kind of better you know, concept or better mythology and stuff, but I love the 100 for that stuff. It's really, really great, and they're doing a great job this season. Massive twist at the end, right? Is Clark going to fight back against Josephine? And this is where it comes in that she has already had the commander chip, which is the advanced technology or the advanced chip. And so, and, and in that sense, it lets the mind of the host, if you will, the commander, like Maddie, right? It lets Maddie's mind still remain, but then add those other elements of the commander. While these prime chips just wipe out the entire mind of the host. So it's interesting here, the concept that they're playing with, whether or not that commander chip and that tech that's already been installed in Clark is going to have some effect on... Uh, you know, whether she's able to fight back against Josephine. I don't, I don't think we'll see Clark for a few episodes at least. I think they're going to really stretch this one out, and it's going to be interesting to see Elizabeth Taylor pull this one off. Uh, I have full confidence in her, and it's going to be a hell of a ride here, so I'm really enjoying it. Favorite character for this one, I got to go with Bellamy Blake, uh, played by Bob Morley. Um, like I mentioned earlier, really great development for him with uh, the Clark scene and Echo. Him and Echo becoming closer while him and Octavia obviously become farther apart. And him feeling that guilt for that decision about Octavia in this episode. Really happy that they're not just pushing him in the background as they did a little bit with Season 5 at times. Um, it looks like, at least so far, he is going to have a big role and they're going to give him that development that he really does need as one of the three, I would say, main characters. So, anyways, really uh, enjoyed what they did with him in this one. Bob Morley, really great. And he did a really great job on that one scene with Echo. I thought, really great acting uh, in that one. And, uh, and yeah, we'll talk about, you know, you can talk about Bellamy and Clark together and, and that stuff. And whether that'll actually happen or not this season. Who knows, right? It's anyone's best guess, I guess, at this point. But it is what it is. But, yeah, Bellamy was really great in this one as well. All right. I just want to do then for my review of the 100 Season 6 Episode 4. Thank you guys so much for watching this one. Thanks so much for the support on the channel and these reviews. I uh, really do appreciate it. Can't thank you guys enough. But anyways, really looking forward to next week's episode to see what the hell is going to happen next year on the 100 Season 6. So with that being said, we'll see you next week then for the 100 Season 6 Episode 5.